Okay, all of you guys, I'm sure, all have a mobile telephone, so this will all be highly relevant. Uh, we are proud to present Carsten and Luca, uh, who are talking about the def much overlooked defensive side of mobile phones. Take it away, guys. Round of applause, please, for Carsten and Luca. Good evening. Um, Honoured to be here for the third year on the same topic. I promise it will be the last one, but it will be a, a conclusive one. Um, pleasure to be here with the fabulous Luca Milette, who will conduct the, the technical demos during this talk. The last years we um, discussed attacks on the much outdated but still very widely used GSM network. Supposedly, three billion people using this technology right now. Um, today, we want to turn to the defenses and um, conclude what networks should do or should already have done to protect you and your privacy much better than they have in the past. Remember, this is a 20-year-old technology, so a lot of it is broken. However, the people designing this have worked on fixes, and now it's time to roll them out. So we will focus on um, how to defend uh, GSM communication from both the network as well as from the phone. But we do have one more attack to add. It wouldn't be a Congress talk without one. This new attack, um, slight deviation on, on what we presented in the past, you may recall that um, cracking GSM keys, the A51 keys, is pretty trivial these days with computing power available to gamers in, in GPU cards. Um, we did use this capacity in the past to show interception of phone calls as well as SMS, but that's not all you can do with it. Um, to introduce the new attack, let me show you um, a related case of, in this case, fraudulent activity. Um, this is somebody's um, VoIP bill. Um, note that they seem to have called quite a bit to a very strange place. This, I believe, is some, some little country in the Caribbean. Um, <clears throat> if you look up the details of this, this phone bill, all these charges occurred within some four hours. So, over a thousand times, a call to the same number in the same remote location. Um, clearly, this was not in the intent of whoever owns this phone line, but uh, conducted such that the, the person doing it gets some revenue. So this is a premium number, they call it. Similar things are observed as mobile viruses. Um, <clears throat> premium numbers have equivalent in the SMS world, premium SMS, where it will be charged, say, for two euros on your phone bill, and whoever owns the numbers gets one euro out of it. The rest kind of trickles down in, the, in, the, in, in all these different operators that connect the call. Um, so there's viruses, for instance, on Android phones that do send SMS on your behalf to make somebody rich. But you don't have to, to actually get a virus installed on the phone to do something similar. Um, and with that, let me... Try to do some connection magic here. There's only one VGA connection, this here. So hopefully this will now connect the other computer. The internet connection isn't working. Um, why don't you just take the, the key from the phone then? I mean, you all believe us that we can crack keys by now, right? Third year. <laughs> so we'll just extract the, the key from the phone, from the SIM card. So this, this is all using the, the Osmocom software. You, you all have come to 
probably love or hate if you're a mobile network operator, um, a completely programmable mobile phone um, that was used to intercept data so we could listen to the voice calls and SMS. And in this case, uh, it again um, captures a transaction, but not with the goal of actually looking very deeply into the transaction. Does this work? <laughs> so each GSM transaction um, is authenticated to the network um, by the equivalent of a username. It's called the TIMC, temporary identity. It's kind of a temporary username. Um, and a secret key, which acts to decrypt and encrypt um, all the communications. It's equivalent to a password. And knowing both this username and the password, um, of course, you could uh, do fun stuff that we'll get to in a minute. Um, but first, we need to crack those, of course. Does this work, or should we just skip this demo? Oh, yeah. We are doing is uh, am I? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I have a victim victim mobile here, and to to get the key and to get the team CD ID of this mobile, I'm going to call this mobile. Luca, can, can, you, can you bump up the font size? Yeah. That would be great. So now, now we are uh, just analyzing all the traffic in our cell, but filtering the traffic just to capture the traffic for this specific mobile phone. And now this, this is kind of a not, not to go to jail filter. So of course we could from all these other phones also, but we choose not to. <laughs> so the red stuff you see is the, the call going on. And unfortunately, I think, I think the, the internet is not working. So I have, oh, sorry. In, increase the font size in the, on, your, on your terminal. Ah, the phone, sorry. Oh. <laughs> so I have here the the key. And <laughs> um, yeah, the key. <laughs> Is it okay? So I have a modified version of Osmocom mobile normal application. This is the configuration file. And here there is some settings for the current cell, current uh, team C. And this is the current key I have here. Yes. So what I'm going to do. Note that it didn't change from when we tried the yeah. experiment before. So this has been the same key for this phone for a while now. I'm going to start a. Well, oh. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> I'm going to do it. Okay, so the firmware is uh, okay. And, and now you're calling this number, right? Th this is oh. the, the mobile I'm impersonating. So th this, is, this is the phone that was called before, and we can and just put it aside so nobody's doing anything with this phone anymore. So now I'm going to start a fake mobile. I enlarge the font here. <laughs> okay. So this fake mobile uh, is on service, is without any authentication, anything. So uh, everything is here. Uh, the key, the cell, and the uh, identity of the other mobile. And now I'm going to call my number. 
<laughs> Decrease the font size. <laughs> well. I hope this is working. So I start here. The call is going on. And this is a call from that mobile. <laughs> so yeah, we, we just uh, impersonated you, you this mobile phone. <laughs> Do you, you want to send an SMS yeah, as well? As well yeah. For completeness. Um. <laughs> so, is this clean? Well, you, you can see the, <clears throat> if you can hear the sound. And if you, if you look here, there is the, the SMS I sent. <laughs> Sorry, my number is this one. <laughs> we'll come back to that as a computer later. No. What? Oh. Okay. So if, if any criminal saw a business case in initiating 1,000 calls on one line, that same criminal should have an incentive of impersonating 1,000 cell phones and doing one call each. Why stop at 1,000, right? This extends to whole populations of phones in cities. From an elevated position, you can um, intercept data from some 35 kilometers away. So imagine how many phones are currently active in, in that range and how much fraud could be conducted. So this finally, hopefully, um, is an attacker scenario where everybody feels affected, um, where the, the whole intercept, a lot of people tell me they never say anything interesting on the phone, so intercept doesn't affect them. Now finally, this should. So um, what, what, what did just happen? Um, the, the real phone, um, made a transaction in which, of course, um, the Timsey was, um, was, was broadcasted um, and the KC, the, the secret key, was used to protect it all. Um, the 10 euro Osmocom phone recorded that data. Um, the computer, had we had an internet connection, would have broken that key within a few seconds, uh, revealing that, that Timsey included in the transaction and those two um, are enough to impersonate a phone call, to make calls and SMS on somebody's behalf, but also um, to, to circumvent authentication methods. <clears throat> Voicemail often um, authenticates based on, on the network level caller ID. So had the News of the World newspaper uh, <laughs> lived to see this, um, they would probably have liked this as a, as a new way of, of accessing people's voicemail, even where the PIN numbers are not weekly set. Um, all right, this should serve as enough motivation. Um, well, let me, let me jump back for a second um, to ask for more, more net protection on the network. And protecting from, from this attack is possible in, in two ways. Um, completely independent way. So one is sufficient to, to prevent it. Um, either you take away people's ability to crack your key. That's how a security system should be designed. It uses encryption, so kids should not be able to decrypt um, things on their gaming machines at home. Now, we're a couple of years um, away from, from seeing a deployment of a, of a much better encryption cipher. So we need some intermediate um, improvement levers to, to protect people <clears throat> today. And I will talk about a way to, um, to, to improve the, the encryption quality without changing the cipher a few slides from here. But there's a second completely complementary way of protecting people. 
and that is by requiring a different password, so to speak, for each call. In fact, the people I talked to that designed GSM, the few that are still around in the community, um, they designed it such that you would need a different key, a different authentication token in each transaction. Now, the networks grew faster than the authentication servers, and so they changed it to every second, every third, every fourth. In some networks, we only see an authentication in one in, of 10 calls. In some networks, we don't see any authentication ever for calls, but really only when you switch on your phone or change your location to a different location area. Um, so the second measure is really trivial. Um, bump up your, your authentication system um, and su such that every key call can have its own authentication run. Um, and in fact, that was one of the five ideas um, we, we put on our wish list uh, a, year from, uh, a year ago from today, um, where we said it's, it's really crucial for networks to uh, change um, their key on every transaction as a security measure. Um, and we promised a year ago um, to check on operators this year whether they have actually done this and also done the other four. So that's what we're going to look into next. Um, a little bit of background, though, so you can appreciate why, why these different measures are needed and how, how effective they could be, even short of changing the encryption function to something much better. Um, GSM cracking equipment. Um, and I'll, I'll t tell a little bit of a war story in a minute about some, some actual equipment that I got to see. Um, GSM cracking equipment um, does rely not just on one factor, uh, on one weakness, this weak encryption function, but on two. They work in the following way. First, they intercept a message, just as, as we did with this phone, and then predict what that message was. Since this is a stream cipher, what comes out of the stream cipher is XORT with a data packet. What the cryptanalysis works on, though, is just the key stream. So you need to reverse the XOR by predicting what the message was. And then given a clear, um, plain a, a clear key stream, that then can be used in the cryptanalysis. Cryptanalysis won't be made any harder until we change the encryption function. However, being able to predict what the message was that can be made much harder. In fact, to network security people, the, the notion of being able to predict what's inside um, an encrypted packet seems ridiculous. Why would you even send a packet that's fully predictable? Right? The other side already knows what, what's in it. Um, but GSM works a little different. You have certain time slots in which you have to send information. And if you have nothing to say, then you send an, a packet that says, I have nothing to say. Right? Or at least, I acknowledge the receipt of your last message, but I don't have anything to say. Please send me your next message. So it goes back and forth. And there's a lot of um, un unused space in GSM, at least as far as the, the control messages go. Um, <clears throat> so in a little bit more detail, what, what would it take to, to do away with uh, this predictability? Um, the, the, one, the one factor that um, these, these crypto boxes our decrypto boxes rely on. Um, there's, there's two types of messages. I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll look at an actual trace on the next slide. Two types of messages that are predictable. Some messages are just very short, and they are filled with, uh, with a filling byte. It's a predictable filling byte, and if the message, the short message, could be, I have nothing to say, is very short, um, then the whole packet becomes predictable. There's other messages that, are, um, that carry more entropy. However, they're sent encrypted and unencrypted. Now, of course, that makes it very predictable, even though it, it may change for, for every cell or, or even every call. Um, now, this reliance seems to much easier to mitigate. In fact, this can be uh, mitigated with just software updates that luckily are available now. A year, a year ago, that, that looked a little different. It wasn't clear who could supply this software update quickly. Um, now, just for completeness, a third um, vulnerability of of GSM, and in particular A51, that's often quoted, in particular in, in research papers, is uh, is the fact that it's a bad crypto function. 
However, though, this seems to be not exploited by anybody. Got some people, some nice publications, um, but it seems that no one actually exploit the badness of A51 beyond its short key size of 64 bits. Now, that should get people thinking when moving to A53, which also has a 64-bit key. So we're not actually moving to an AS grade encryption function, but a block cipher instead of a stream cipher that still only encrypts to 64 bits, just as a side remark. So it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get uh, better more than two orders of magnitude. And given Moore's, Moore's law, of course, um, the crackers will catch up there too. Um, so it seems that even when moving to a better uh, encryption function, fixing this problem is worthwhile. Um, Here's an actual GSM trace, all the messages sent to the phone from the base station at the beginning of a transaction. And you can see basically three different groups of, of messages. There are the ones that are very short and then filled mostly with this 2B two, two byte. So this one, this one, this one, and this fourth one. They're, they basically just say, I acknowledge your message, please send the next one. Um, there, there are other messages um, that are still filled with, uh, with this padding byte because they're not full lengths, but they carry entropy. So they are not really predictable. They differ per call, um, these two in this case. And then there are messages that are full. These are control messages where the cell broadcasts its neighbors, for instance. Um, but those are also sent in the clear. So there's no point of encrypting them at all. And if you do, you give uh, attack surface to, to um, whoever wants to do the decryption. Now, those predictable messages, the first and the third category, um, will go away as soon as operators implement um, two, two different um, software level mitigations. Um, the one was standardized a couple of years ago and is now available widely. The other one was just standardized um, Based, based on the, the critique on, on GSM this past year, um, so it's still in the making at the operators. Um, so operators ask me a lot how effective these, these measures could be in, in defeating um, phone attacks, and they're equally worried about hackers using uh, these phones and their home computers, as well as professional spy equipment. So at least some operators have a real draw towards um, protecting their customers from spy equipment. There's a large market for GSM spy equipment. It used to be the domain of law enforcement intelligence, um, but as prices go down and uh, sales managers get greedy, of course, this trickles down to other sales channels where I would imagine criminals now can easily get their hands on on spy equipment. Um, so I did go to this, um, to this spy conference, the ISS, um, to, to see what, what they have on offer and um, whether this measure would actually defeat them. And um, to our all's luck, um, no, nobody uh, in a professional sp spying on GSM world seems to be aware of this development. And so, meaning that at least the, the entire installed base of GSM spying equipment could be driven out of business was just implementing these two ideas. And then for a few years, um, it would hopefully stay that way. Of course, eventually they would find a way around it, but that's exactly the time frame we need to deploy A53 and to make phones well protected on, on at least a block cipher uh, um, level. Um, so the way this will be rolled out um, is, is in stages. Um, as I said, uh, the, the, the measures that were, deploy, uh, that were developed in 2008 are now available from, from all the major uh, equipment manufacturers, being mostly Nokia, Siemens, and Ericsson in Europe. Um, so you can um, get software patches from them and upgrade your existing infrastructure to randomize, they call it, the padding. Um, this will make um, GSM spy equipment work much less effectively. Um, there's still a tech surface, um, namely um, th these very messages, these control messages, where there's no red to be to be randomized, um, but the, the success rate of 
um, of, these, of this equipment will go down significantly. Even more so when these additional messages are also randomized. Um, and that's up to really Nokia and, and Ericsson now to develop, test, and deploy these patches to their customers. Finally, to fully make this equipment stop, um, the phone manufacturers, not necessarily of this phone, but of more, of more modern phones, um, they also need to randomize the data that's sent in the other direction, from the phone to the base station. It's harder to intercept, but in some cases still interceptable. Interestingly enough, I mean, we all know how quickly uh, phones evolve. We've only observed a single phone that implements this improvement measure from 2008. So uh, soon enough, once the network deploys the software patches, it will, the phone will become the weakest link in this security chain. But then again, it only takes a few years for all the phones to be replaced with, with something new. So there's hope that um, not long from now, um, GSM spy equipment will stop working. Um, we wanted to, to know how far down the, the, the road of improving GSM network operators already are today. Basically checking our wish list from last year, which ever since has grown to some 21 items, um, 21 security parameters that we think networks should set in certain ways to protect from attacks. Um, it turns out that that networks very greatly in security um, configuration. In fact, it seems that, that for, for most networks, a few exceptions, um, parameters that are security relevant are more or less set randomly. Um, one being, of course, the, the number of authenticated calls we, we talked about before, which should be 100%, but then as your, as your network population and the number of calls they're making increases, um, this number is often set set down to postpone network upgrades. Also, this has an effect on call setup time, which network operators consider their, their core quality indicator. I mean, do you care if it takes half a second longer to dial a number? I certainly don't. Um, but they, they seem to think that's the, the most important thing their customers want from the network, that, that half a second time safe. Um, there are networks, however, that don't authenticate any call, apparently. Um, and that just seems misconfiguration to me. Um, at least as long as your VLR, HLR, that's these, these backend systems have capacity, this should be um, checked. Now, it's, it looks even worse when, when looking at the software update. So authentication existed when GSM was first deployed 20 years ago. The newer software updates, though, the ones that now Nokia and Ericsson uh, have on offer, are only implemented in very few places. And, and even um, blocking HLR queries, you may remember uh, Tobias Engel's talk from years ago, where he criticized you could track users over the internet. Even uh, long-running vulnerabilities like that are only mitigated in the fewest of places. Right? So there's certainly um, a, a lot of um, claim by operators we implement newest technology, but at the same time, the 2G network that's still exposing people to vulnerabilities um, is kind of a le left rotting uh, at the 20-year-old level. We want to change that. We want each and every one of you, plus whoever else is interested in GSM security, to keep checking on your operator and to verify that your operator actually deploys security patches that are much needed. Um, we did collect for, for this survey um, data in, in countries mostly surrounding Germany. And um, let me, let me skip, skip over this for a second and put them on an online map um, that map is far from complete. Actually, try to, to access that. Um, so here's a map, gsmmap.org, uh, publicly accessible. This map is far from complete. Um, so we want everybody's help um, in filling all the remaining spots on this map and to, to make network security comparable among different countries, um, make operators within one country. And let me just click on Germany here. If I, oh God. 
um, you see how, how widely operators um, differ. Um, we want customers to be able to compare different network security and create demand with their feed by, by going to where the most secure network is for them. Um, so this is an online tool for you to use and please to contribute data to. Um, all it takes to contribute data from your location um, is one of these phones and the software you can download under this link. Um, and then everything else is automated. It takes a couple of minutes after you uploaded the traces, but then whatever country you upload data from, I'm most interested in these countries down here. They spy so much on their citizens. I'm, I'm interested in whether they actually protect them from, from other countries spying on them or not. So if anybody is down here with one of these phones, please contribute data. Um, so, um, the, the security for each of these networks is, is ranked in three categories uh, with the buttons up here. And let me, with that, actually go back to the, um, to the presentation here. Um, these three categories encode protection against three different attacks. Basically, the sum of the attacks presented here by different people. Um, today's impersonation attack, how difficult is it to put, uh, to put fraudulent charges on somebody's account to access their voicemail and so forth? Second attack, intercept. How difficult is it to, to um, listen in on somebody's phone calls or read their SMS? And lastly, tracking people, both globally uh, through internet leaked information, where is somebody, as in what city, as well as locally, um, tying together transactions you observe based on the TIMSIs. Um, so each of these has, has a number of parameters behind them. Um, and we do expect, and this is the reference for, for this year, we do expect the best network, the 100% network, the one that would get a full green circle, to implement all the ideas we see out there. So we're not asking for anything impossible. We see networks that do it already. And we would like a network that does all these good ideas at the same time. Some networks get close, but nobody actually matches that. So currently, each network is vulnerable to these three threats to different degrees. We will update the reference every year um, to, to keep chasing them and, and keep, uh, keep them in a security race that, of course, an operator will have to run as fast as the hackers do. And um, to my knowledge, next year, operators will start deploying A53. So by the end of next year, you will have to have A53 as an operator to, again, be close to 100%. So, all, all the software is online to contribute to this um, tutorial as well. So, we, we hope to, to, get to, 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 to keep, to keep the, the networks busy and improving. Some already have. We were surprised to see that by January this year, um, one of the German networks had, had already implemented half of our wish list from December. So, it must not take long uh, if, if a network really wants to improve. Um, switching to, 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 the, to the last of three acts here, um, we so far discussed protections that come from the networks and a little bit from the phone. Basically, whoever supplies us with equipment and service should take care of our security. This still leaves some attack vectors. One, uh, one network level that's most concerning to me is since uh, at least from going to this ISS conference, I understand that, that this seems to be the best seller in the spy world. Um, and that is uh, fake base stations or IMSI catcher attacks, in which somebody uh, emulates your local network, your Vodafone or telecom network, and then sets whatever security they want on this. Uh, and of course, whatever your real network does, good or bad, at that point doesn't matter anymore. So we also want to create some traction towards defeating this threat. And while we cannot completely mitigate it, it's just in the design of GSM, authentication is missing, we can make it much less likely to occur. And with that, let me, let me pass back to, to Luca um, to explain how such, an, such equipment is working and how we could defeat it. Yeah, probably you know the concept of IMSI catcher is basically a fake uh, BTS 
and they are used for different purposes. Uh, the basic one, for example, to, to collect the identity of users in a certain area, uh, the point one. So you just install a fake BTS with a high, high power and all the mobiles uh, see this BTS and they just try to do the location update. The BTS, the BTS collects the identity and then rejects the location. So the mobile doesn't care about this. So you can easily collect IDs. Uh, another way of using an IMSI catcher is to, of course, make the, the mobile connect to the BTS and then ask the mobile to start a call that is actually not a call. So you make the mobile enter a traffic channel and then the mobile waits for the connection uh, establishment, but this connection establishment doesn't arrive. And if you are in the nearby, you can track the signal since the mobile maybe is sending at the maximum power, so you can actually locate the, the, the mobile. Uh, or even more you can do is an active attack, like a man in the middle, you can uh, use a fake BTS that allows the mobile to connect and to route the traffic like calls or SMS. And basically they don't use encryption, so you have some mean to recognize it. But normal phones doesn't, doesn't care if you are transmitting without encryption. And we are going to analyze all the kind of treats we have in IMSI catchers. And for example, uh, you can see the evidence. The, the first, the first type of uh, IMSI catcher uh, sends location uh, rejects. So we are going to see if the BTS is sending that. Um, or for example, we monitor the power, the, the transmission power. Or for example, uh, we see if the ciphering is used before, after. And so there are some means to, to recognize it. But maybe we are not using all the, the, the features we can. And we, we started a project. And uh, mm -hmm. it's still uh, at, the, at the beginning. And basic uh, Osmocom software with some patches to, to recognize all these things I, I said. And we can, we can start the the demo and yeah, the, the the name is catcher catcher, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and c can we switch here? Sure, yeah. So to to rephrase that, uh, we want to enable everybody with such a phone to collect evidence that there is IMSI catchers operating in their area, um, which. You saw on the slide, networks could have done a long time ago by collecting the evidence visible on their side. However, none of them has done so. Uh, my suspicion is that they just fear to interfere with law enforcement activity. Of course, IMSI catchers are used by law enforcement, but not just by law enforcement. And even when it seems that lawful intercept should, should uh, be executed in different ways than, than over the air through fake BTS with lots of casualties. Um, so while the networks don't do it, um, we want to detect IMSI catchers and other privacy intruding attacks. Um, can you increase the font size? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> font size up. You don't need? No, um, no, not this one, not this one. Okay. Next window. So while, while we didn't bring an IMSI catcher, of course, um, that, that would be difficult to operate with. With, with so many people around. Um, we we want to demo briefly um, the, the detection of another type of attack. Yeah, that is not in the slides. It's the silent SMS used by law enforcement agencies to, um, to make the mobile answer this SMS and to locate the mobile. And, and, and a little bit of context on that. In, in Germany, um, news broke some, some two, three weeks ago that uh, a single law enforcement agency here did send 150,000 silent SMSs within a year to track people's location. And the way this works is they have access to 
with transaction metadata. They don't, they're not allowed to look into transactions themselves. But sending a silent SMS to a phone creates a line in that metadata database from which they can then deduce the location. So this happened from a single agency 150,000 times in one year. So you can extrapolate how, how often this really occurs in the real world. Um, and go ahead. Yeah, what you need is actually the same mobile you know and a SIM card from one of the operators you want to monitor. So this is the software that uh, used to be a normal mobile software. So this connects to the, to the, to the BTS. And now the mobile is uh, connected. I want to show you from the talent part of the Osmocom what happens. So once the mobile is turned on, it looks for the, the cell and then is, it establishes a link channel. And I'm monitoring the time I wait until I get some important data like mm, the, the service I, I want. Then I monitor the algorithm. That this, is, this is the normal one, but it could be uh, no ciphering, for example. And I mo also monitor the uh, IMEI SV that is important for, um, it's important for cr cracking, actually, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's also some identity you, you are um, uh, exposing to the, to the network. So this is just a transaction. What I want to show you is this extra menu I, I created is uh, really uh, on, on progress, so uh, you have here a summary of what the mobile did. So uh, this is some, something I transmitted, something that BTS asked me, and uh, for example, this is the, the, the power measurement that says if the BTS asked me to transmit at maximum power or too much high power, and in this case, it's not. It's normal BTS. And yeah, this is the log of previous and last algorithm. Uh, some, this is not correct, but is current MCC, MNC. And this is all normal stuff. And you can see at the end there is a flag that is indicating whether the BTS is uh, trusted, not so trusted, or you have to, to turn off the mobile because you have been tracked. So I'm going to, to show you what happens if I send a silent SMS, as Kasten was saying before. They are not uh, shown, but normal phones. Yeah, they're, they're processed in the phone and even responded to, but never shown to the user. So nobody really understands why this feature exists on phones, but law enforcement likes it a lot. Yeah, so this is the notification. This is my hidden number. And <laughs> and this is the same uh, log, and you can see the flag now is yellow because it's not so good to receive a silent SMS. <laughs> and then, yeah, it's still in progress. So I hope somebody can contribute because we couldn't try it with a, a commercial IMC catcher. We have just some equipment, but not a commercial one. Yeah, so we, we implemented all the puzzle pieces to detect MZ catchers. However, nobody wants to loan us one. Um, <laughs> Sachsen or Bayern, yeah. Um, we did uh, implement a long list of measures, actually, and now ask you as the community to continue this project or help us continue it. So these are all the, um, all the, the pieces of evidence currently implemented in the software. And this being just a derivative of Osmocom, of course, everybody can continue this research. Um, both through helping us understand how actual IMSI catchers work. We have good suspicions, or also talk to people that have built them in the past. However, th what we're lacking is actual testing. Um, so we envision uh, people that, that suspect they're being in a 
uh, in an IMSI catcher location or being tracked through silent SMS to put that SIM card in an Osmocom phone and let this run for a couple of hours, collect evidence, and then know whether it's being attacked or not. Um, eventually, maybe, we can even start a network of such phones um, that automatically report IMSI catcher activity. I would suspect them, for instance, close to uh, major embassies in any capital um, where you know, they, they just harvest information from wherever they can. And if you think about where the Bundestag is in Germany and what embassies are around it, they could easily attract all the phones from, from our parliament, right? Um, I'd like to create transparency around that, wh whether that actually happens now that the network operators haven't done so. Um, and with that, uh, we, we, we come to the end of, of um, this hopefully last iteration of, of criticizing GSM networks for being too insecure. Because from now on, you can take up that task and start creating demand. Um, you now have an attack scenario that really everybody should, be, should sympathize with, that of course they don't want to look through their phone bill every month for premium SMS charges and so forth. Um, you have an online tool to compare different networks and to criticize the weak ones, still criticizing the secure ones. Nobody implements all the, the good ideas. Um, you have a way of, of filling this online tool with one of these phones um, to create more transparency in, in reach, all the corners of the world that we don't get to go to, um, as well as uh, over time. Networks that do improve in security, of course, should uh, should, should be signaled as such through that tool. Um, and finally, you have a software running on the Osmocom to self-defend yourself from attacks your, your network is not really responsible for. So with all of this, hopefully we can start an evolution in GSM security and make this 20-year-old technology finally become secure. We have an historical chance of driving all this spy equipment out of business, at least for a couple of years, till we get really good encryption. So please help us with this. And thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Carsten. We have, uh, I think we've got about 10, 15 minutes here for questions, and apparently we have a lot of questions uh, from uh, the internet. Um, if you have a question to ask, can you please uh, line up between uh, using the microphones in the uh, aisles here? And uh, what I'll do is uh, we'll start with some questions from the internet, and then uh, we'll move to uh, questions from the room. Okay. So there were quite a a handful of questions on the IRC. Um, first of all, can you spoof phones on... Um, well, can you spoof any cell phone or just cell phones if the spoofed phone was logged in a short time ago? I understand you, Ladani. Sorry. A bit louder. Can I... Can you guys keep it down, please? Because we are having a question and answer session here. Um, please be polite and just be quiet. <coughs> Okay, again, I'm sorry. Um, can you spoof any cell phone or can you only spoof phones which were locked in a short time ago? Well, yeah, you need to, to be in the same location area. That means some kilometer. I mean, I was in Berlin, some in meter, and it was the same cell, same cell location area. So, same city. We say same city, you can spoof uh, another user. Yes, and spoofing, spoofing works as long as the phone is where it was when you attacked it, as in location area. So location areas are really big. Cities usually have only a couple of them. It still needs to be in the same location area, and it must not have changed its key. If somebody does a lot of transaction and you only um, cracked an early one, it may well be that it already moved on to another key. But other than that, uh, most phones are affected. Um. Um, 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 let me sort a bit, sorry. Where's the bottleneck in the provider companies that prevents the improvement in security? Is the middle management or is it also the technical department? Sorry, sorry if you let me first done. <laughs> in the uh, provider security, is it in the management 
management oh. or is it on the technical side? Well, e each, of, e each of these countermeasures has, has a different bottleneck. Um, sometimes it seems just testing time to deploy a Nokia patch. Sometimes it's actually buying a new HLR VLR system, maybe for half a million, that then uh, ramps up the capacity of your authentication system to where you need it. Um, and then with an A53 deployment, the new, um, the, the, the new encryption function, oftentimes a complete new GSM network is needed. Um, Swisscom, um, the, the Swiss operator, this week announced that they are actually creating a whole new GSM network. So it does happen oftentimes to get the network ready for LTE. So within this wave, we'll, we'll see a lot of A53 deployment, but not in networks that just stick with, with the old paid down equipment. OK. Hi. Um, Hi, Jake. Great talk. That was really Thank great. I, I know some places where there are some insect catchers. <laughs> if you'd like to come over to my house or to the Bale Mansion. Um, one way that you can catch MC catchers, I've heard, is that it's possible to, um, when, say, US law enforcement comes to Europe to surveil people, they forget to switch the country code and the mobile network operator. So your phone asks if you want to roam. And they've turned off all the other cell phone towers, so you'll join their MC catcher. And so if the phone is trying to roam, it, it actually, in, in places where it's not, that's another vector for detecting it. Yeah. Um, our, our threshold was a little higher. Detecting MC catcher with stupid operators um, <laughs> is possible w without much technology. But we want to go as far as detecting MC catchers um, that do encrypt. So there are MZ catchers that do real-time cracking of keys and then initiate uh, transactions in both directions with encryption. And they're pretty hard to catch, but there's still a few things that they have to do to operate correctly that a normal network would not do. And the list is online. That was actually one, one uh, interesting thing here is that I've noticed that the MC catcher at my house, um, <laughs> I'll just be honest one, about yeah. it, right? <laughs> just the one. Um, one of them uh, only seems to activate itself for my particular uh, IMEI. And so it's a little, I mean, come on, it's like not even hard to figure out who's doing that. But an interesting problem here is that in detecting them, there's selective targeting of targets. So is it possible for the Osmocom phone to pretend to be my Android's IMEI. I'm asking that in the most legally ambiguous way possible. Sure, that, that's possible, but um, I don't think it's, it's possible for the, for the IMSI catcher to be perfectly selective. So it has to get in touch with all the other phones to reject them first. And this reject, of course, is observable and very atypical for GSM. And another vector is if you call 911, a lot of these will actually <laughs> kick you off of the IMSI catcher and allow you to associate uh -huh. with the tower nearby so that the 911 call won't go through the MC catcher, so there'll be no trail that oh. leads to law enforcement in looking at other law enforcement agencies. That, that's missing on the list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, don't that, forget, yeah. when, <laughs> when in doubt, call 911. Thank you. OK, we'll go with uh, Mo. OK, uh, you're next. Hi. Um, you mentioned that some phones uh, support these uh, handheld encryption. Um, improvements. Uh, would you like to tell us which manufacturers are doing that and if there's anything that we as consumers can do to encourage more manufacturers to do that? Sure, yeah. Um, so modern phones pretty much all support the A53 cipher. That only started some two years ago though. So a lot of deployed phones don't understand A53. There's one phone, however, that claims to be supporting A53, and if you try to initiate a transaction with it, it can't because it was never implemented. Like some if else was, was switched around. Now this phone, this very one phone, is responsible for at least two operators to hold back the A53 trials because those users of this phone would, would stop having service. Uh, so there's a little bit of confusion. Um, the, the manufacturer of that phone supposedly now pays for the patches so that Nokia and Ericsson can detect this phone and know it doesn't understand it. It takes a few more months. Um, the second security improvement that phones desperately need, even before A53 deployment, uh, is the, the uplink randomization. And the only phone where we have ever observed this is the latest BlackBerry Bolt. 9,900, I think the number is. Um, every other phone, even though this is a three-year-old idea, does not implement that. 
Um, now, I would be surprised to find that the BlackBerry Bold has a chipset that no other phone uses. So at least Qualcomm or one of these chip manufacturers must have implemented it. All the other phone companies just forgot to switch it on. Right? So US customers can demand that as a feature. Um, not saying you should buy BlackBerry, but at least tell Apple that you also want that. <laughs> OK, we have uh, time for uh, one more question from the internet, but this gentleman here first. Uh, if you spoof the, uh, the weak James mobile phone, is it also possible to intercept incoming phone calls, for example, by mm -hmm. answering faster than the original phone? Yeah, the problem is right. The, the you have to be quicker than the normal user, but you can actually. Uh, I tested it, and uh, unfortunately, Osmocom is a little slower. But <laughs> <laughs> so you don't have to be faster, as in pressing the button faster. The phone actually has to be faster in acknowledging the incoming call, and mm -hmm. Osmocom isn't faster than any phone right now. <laughs> wow! Thanks. Okay, um, one more, one last question from uh, the internet. Yep. Um, how much security does implementing A53 actually give us, and what about 3G? Uh, well, these are different different questions because um, 3G is already present on all these phones we impersonate. Well, most of them anyway. Um, we can still spoof it on a 2G network. So adding a secure network uh, doesn't always help as long as you don't remove the insecure network. Um, A53, the encryption cipher that's already used in uh, in, in uh, 3G with a longer key size, though, porting that back to GSM, of course, greatly improved the resistance uh, against impersonation and intercept, but only for phones that support it. Um, this will be most newer phones, but there's a lot, lot of deployed base out there that, that will never get A53 anymore. Um, so protecting those also requires all the other measures, even if we could have A53 overnight. But given that this, this one phone now holds back the A53 deployment, um, de implementing all the other measures is worthwhile anyway. OK. Um, it looks like you've successfully managed to batter the internet into submission and uh, the room as well. So can we have a big hand, please, for uh, Carsten Luca? Thank you. Brilliant work, guys. <laughs>